and ethanol fuel it can cause catastrophic issues. If you get water in the gas, it goes into your VST, your injectors, it goes into the engine. If it gets too much, then one of the biggest problems that you're going to have with an outboard is when you let it sit. If it doesn't get used for six years, that's potentially a problem. From the battery to your outboard, you've got this one spot. It's got a poor connection, starting issues, charging issues that can do all kinds of things that will mess stuff up. Problems that you'll face with having an outboard engine, what to look for when buying an outboard, what makes an outboard unreliable, and how to make your outboard more reliable at home. These are just a few of the discussions that we'll be having on today's episode of the Boaters Podcast. Now, outboard's number one problem is most likely going to be fuel. I'm talking about bad gas, sludge in the gas, um, old fuel, and dirty fuel. It's just such a hard thing anymore with ethanol and all the other products that we put into fuel these days to try and make it better and more reliable. It's just a problem for an outboard engine, especially when it's not like a car. In your car, you fill your car up with gas and then you run it for you know a couple of weeks until you got to fill up again. So you're always burning through that fuel. Whereas on your boat, I mean, some of these boats have 100 gallons, 200 gallons, 300 gallons of fuel on them. And for a lot of people, you don't get to use your boat like that every single day where you're just going through a ton of fuel. So if you can get through a tank of gas in two to three, four months, that's a different story. So now your fuel is sitting. And with the way outboards have gone with the electronic fuel injection and all the other temperamental things that go into the fuel system, like the fuel pumps and the injectors and everything else, it's a lot more common to have problems with the fuel system, especially if you have gas that sits for a long period of time. And then if you get a batch of bad gas, like you get some water in it or something like that, then that's going to mess up the entire fuel system. It can lock up your fuel pumps. It can mess up the pressure regulators. It can clog your injectors. And so when it comes to seeing problems with an outboard, a lot of times it's with the fuel system and it's not really anybody's fault. I mean, yeah, if you get a batch of bad gas from a fuel station like a marina or something like that, that's a different story. But by and large, on older boats, like if you've got a leaking fuel sender or you've got a um, like the fill tank. So where you put the gas in, there's O-rings and stuff on there. If one of those O-rings fails and it rains a lot, then you can get water into your fuel tank. And if that water goes straight into your engine, now you got a problem because water will rust stuff. It'll lock things up. The fuel pump is meant to move fuel. And if you just run in fuel, it's not going to mess up the pump. But if that pump runs water and then sits for a week or two, then all the gears and everything inside of that pump is going to rust and it's going to fall apart. All that rust now is going to go into your injectors, which is going to clog the injectors, causing you all kinds of problems, which is why I it's very rare to see a boat that does not have a water separator on it. I mean, if you don't have a water separator on your boat, that's a problem. Unless you're running like a dinghy or something where you've got a portable tank where you're talking about having, you know, a five gallon tank or something like that, you're not going to have an issue with not having a water separator because your tank is is so small that you know when you fill it up and then you can see what's going in the tank and all that kind of stuff. So it's those are the only boats that you're going to that you should see that don't have a water separator on them. Everything else, though, anything from, you know, anything that you, where you don't have a portable tank in it should have a water separator in it. That way, if you do get any water into your fuel tank, which does happen because the boat's fuel tank is going to be vented to the outside. So it is vented to the outside atmosphere. And in the morning, you know, you got condensation, you got fog, you got a lot of moisture in the air. And so over time, that moisture can build up inside of the fuel tank, especially if you're running ethanol fuel, which in a lot of locations these days, there's no other option but ethanol fuel, which causes a problem because if you get water in the gas, then you suck it up. If you don't have that water separator, it goes into your VST or your carburetors or whatever, and then that goes through to your injectors, goes into the engine. Now you're, now you're burning off that water. You'll be able to burn a little bit of water off, but if it gets too much, then it can cause catastrophic issues. Outside of just the fuel system being the fuel pump and the pressure regulator, the injectors, all that stuff, which is going to be costly in and of itself if you have 
that pri that issue. So that's why I say that the number one issue is going to be fuel when it comes to an outboard engine. Um, the dirty gas is the same thing. If you got a bunch of dirt in there and you're not running a water separator and you're not changing your fuel filters on a regular, then that dirt is going in there. It's going to go through your fuel pump, which is going to mess up the fuel pump. It's going to go through your injectors, which is going to mess up your injectors and it'll go into the combustion chamber, which will cause problems there as well. So making sure you have good, clean fuel can be a good way for you to avoid having an issue with your fuel system. And especially if you change your water separators on the regular, uh, once, twice a year, or you can even check them. But if you do check them, don't dump them out and then dump the fuel back into the separator because all you did is you took the separator that's been separating all this dirt from your engine, you poured it all out into a container, and now you're going to dump it back into the filter and run it straight into the engine. So if you do dump them out, try and have a, you know, a gas can or something with clean fuel that you can fill the separator up with clean fuel before you stick it back on, or you'll have the issue of air locking your fuel system, meaning that you just took this water separator that's say this big, and you put that into you know, you put that onto the bracket. Now you've got that much air from your fuel tank to your engine, which could be hard on your fuel tank. So it's always a good idea to pre-fill your water separators. Now, the next thing I would say that is a problem for outboard is going to be electrical issues. That's talking about bad connections to the battery, a low battery, um, corroded connections on the cables running to it or bad cables running to your engine. And then um, chafing, chafing wires, failing starters, alternators, um, corrosion on components, stuff like that. That is a very, very common issue to have with an outboard, especially the dirty battery connections, even the issue with having a bad battery. If you got a bad battery, obviously none of the pro none of the stuff on the engine is going to run because it's all electrical. So having a good battery is always number one. And then number two, those cables going from the battery to the engine. A lot of times nowadays you want to put the batteries up in the console for a weight, you know, reduction issue or just a weight balance for the boat. So whenever you do that, you've got to have these battery cables to go all the way back to the outboard. There's a lot of companies, and a lot of people that what you do is you now have transfer lugs in the bilge or in the back of the boat where you've got a battery cable that goes from the battery switch to the back to this power post that's in the back of the boat. And then from there to the engine. Well, it's in a wet environment being in the bilge or the back of the boat. And so you can see these connections corrode or get dirty or become loose over time. And now you've got this from the battery to your outboard. You've got this one spot that has got a poor connection that gives you starting issues that can give you charging issues that can do all kinds of things that will mess stuff up. The charging issue is actually a little bit more common than people might think because the way an outboard charges is you've got either an alternator or a stator and that, that component is going to be able to put out a lot of amps. A lot of times it has a regulator built into the alternator or some outboards will have a rectifier regulator on the engine. Now, what that does is it that alternator or that stator is going to create, let's say at max output, it creates 25, 26, 27 volts of electricity, and that is sent to the battery. Well, that rectifier regulator, what that is doing is it's sensing that voltage. So if that component sees that the battery is at 11, then it's going to allow more power to flow from the charging system to your battery to try and get that battery to come up. So if you've got a bad connection at one of these transfer lugs in the back of the boat, then that reg that regulator is reading the voltage coming from the battery. Even though the battery is charged, the rectifier regulator can only see, you know, 12 or, or a lower voltage than what it's looking for. So it's going to tell that alternator or that stator to give out everything that it's got that can burn up your stator. It can burn up your alternator and cause you issues when you're over here trying to look at your battery and think you got a bad battery. When in reality, you've got a bad connection at one of these transfer lugs in the back of the boat, which is a lot more common than you might think alternators. That's another electrical issue that can go bad. They just wear out. Or like I was saying with the charging issue, if it's just putting out all the time, 
because of a bad connection going to the battery and it's never really getting that power to the battery or sometimes engines will have a an isolated charging side to the system so you've got battery power that goes to the engine and that's what lets the engine start run and function normally and then they've taken the power going from the alternator or the stator and run a separate wire from that to a let's call it a junction bar or an automatic switch relay of some sort where it can charge more than one battery or it just charges through a different leg coming out of the engine and if you've got a an issue between the battery and the engine where the engine is seeing that voltage and then it's putting out that power on a different leg then you can overcharge your batteries and run the batteries that's just another case where these bad connections or dirty connections or a broken wire or a loose connection at a transfer lug can cause you issues with your batteries or your charging system both being electrical and then on top of that your components since everything on the engine is now electrical you've got all these sensors you got all these wire harnesses you got these computers there's just so many components that now have a part from a problem you know you're talking about a boat everything is wet you got a lot of water you got a lot of moisture you got a lot of condensation and over time if you don't clean the engine you're going to have problems with these electrical components. And on top of that, I would say that we would could move over to mechanical issues are going to be things like, you know, your power head, your lower unit, um, oil systems, cooling systems, stuff like that. Even though on a cooling system, you know, if you got a problem with your impeller, that's more of a service item outside of a mechanical failure, like a, you know, a lower unit that, that blows up or a power head that runs low on oil for so long and overheats stuff like that that causes a catastrophic mechanical error um, that's going to be a less common issue even though it does happen especially as an outboard gets older that's just how an outboard fails is over time engine hours stuff like that take an outboard that gets run a lot and it gets run low on oil which is going to be causing stress and strain on the engine and therefore you'll call cause premature failure of that engine Again, a mechanical issue, but I wouldn't necessarily call that a common issue unless you lack in the maintenance department. Same thing with the cooling department. If you don't change your impeller on the regular and your, your outboard starts to overheat, that can cause you all kinds of problems as well. Um, if you pick something up, say you run through a weed line or you run shallow a lot and you pick up a lot of dirt, algae, grass, stuff like that, and it starts clogging your, your cooling system, now your engine's not cooling properly and it, you you could overheat it if you overheat your engine bad enough you can warp valve covers you can um, melt other plastic components mess up sensors with plastic housings on them stuff like that you will cause mechanical failures based on the overheat and then moving on from that i would say that corrosion issues are going to be another common problem to find with an outboard more common in saltwater environments than in freshwater environments but you can also see them at larger marinas where you've got stray current in the water let's say you've got underwater lights a boat lift um, docks that have power on them stuff like that if you have an issue where you have stray current in the water that's going to cause you corrosion issues outside of like a very high salt environment like you know a warmer salt water where just the differences in the metal causes all kinds of corrosion issues if you don't change your anodes regularly or you don't have um, proper grounding on the boat if you look in a lot of boats all the through holes and outboard brackets stuff like that a lot of them are grounded with a with a grounding circuit they call it bonding a lot of those have a bonding system where all those metal components that are touching the water have a a common bond between them so that way they're all connected and it will help alleviate the corrosion issue that you have just from sticking dissimilar metals in a body of water and having them close to each other which creates an electrical current basically then you've also going to be seeing things like propeller issues uh, propeller issues from running in shallow water uh, running aground if you hit something that's submerged you know a tree stump or a rock or something like that that's just below the waterline um, different things like that 
that's going to cause you a problem. So let's say you run in a lake and there is a high potential for you hitting something that's submerged. A lot of these lakes, some of these reservoirs and stuff were made by the um, Corps of Engineers where they take a place and they flood it basically. So if you got all these trees in this lake and they flood that area, all those trees are still there and they just created this body of water like a reservoir or something like that. Having an aluminum prop versus a stainless steel prop is gonna be beneficial in these types of scenarios. So if you're running in really shallow water and you don't wanna mess up your lower unit, it might be better for you to run an aluminum prop. So that way, if you hit something like a tree or a stump or something like that, then the aluminum prop is gonna bend. The ears of the prop are gonna bend, whereas a stainless steel prop that's not going to bend. The technology today has been where it's built into the hub. So the hub will give and hopefully not mess up the lower unit. But whenever you've got like a stainless steel prop and a solid hub, if you hit something submerged, that prop is not going to give and that hub's not going to give. So what's going to happen is the gears in the lower unit is what's going to take the hit. So when the propeller hits the submerged item, the rock or whatever it may be, that's going to stop the prop from spinning the gears that are trying to turn that propeller are what's going to give. So when the prop stops, it's just going to grind those gears right off. You know, you're going to lose the lower unit or potentially the drive shaft to the lower unit. That's a common one where the power head's going to be spinning and it's, you know, you hit that submerged item. And when you hit that, it stops the propeller. When the propeller stops, it locks up the lower unit and the engine continues to turn. And as that turns, the drive shaft that goes into the power head, it just rips the drive shaft right off or well, it cuts it off. So say you've got, you know, the drive shaft going up, it'll just snap it off. So now you've got a little piece of the drive shaft stuck in the power head and the drive shaft going to the lower unit is, is not going to be turning when the engine's turning. You know, a lot of people going offshore, you don't run that risk. So running stainless steel props is it's better because you don't have the flex in the prop. So it, it helps in efficiency, speed, stuff like that. Whereas the aluminum prop, because of the power of the engine, aluminum will flex a little bit. So you're going to lose some performance based on the flexing in the prop compared to the stainless steel prop, which is just kind of a little bit of a discussion between aluminum prop versus a stainless steel prop and the benefits of the stainless over the aluminum. And then I would say the next issue for having a problem with an outboard is going to be the lack of maintenance. Uh, most commonly are going to be grease points and stuff like that. So let's say like your tilt tubes, your steering system, uh, like the steering bracket, cowling latch handles, um, oil pumps on older two strokes, tr strokes, stuff like that. Anything with mechanical cables, all of those things, if you don't get grease on them or you don't get oil on them and you let them sit, then they can, they can rust, they can freeze up, they'll lock up. And then when you go to use it, they'll break. Say you've got an older engine, 10, 15, 20 years old, and it has not been greased properly. Well, the grease eventually dries up as you turn your engine. So you've got the steering bracket and the engines on it and it turns like this as you steer. Well, there's grease fittings there. And if you don't get those greased on the regular, then that grease will dry up. It'll eventually wear its, work its way out and then it'll be dry in there. And that'll eventually bind up to where it won't take any grease and it will just, it'll make your steering really stiff and you'll have a problem there. Also, same thing for handles, cowling latch handles where you try and undo the handle that keeps the cowling on. If those don't get grease or oiled, over time, they'll lock up and then you can't even get the cowling off the engine. And then also your tilt tube, those where the engine on the bracket goes up and down, that will also has grease fittings that if it doesn't get greased regularly, that can cause you a problem. So you definitely want to look out for those things. All that stuff I would say is going to be a maintenance issue. So when it comes to looking out for things, when you go to buy an outboard, most of it is all going to be visual. I mean, you want to visually look at the engine. You're looking for scratches. You're looking for, you know, the lower unit where the lower unit is. Has it been run shallow? Is the skeg missing? Uh, is all the paint missing off of the lower unit? Looking around the edges of the lower unit, is it all like dinged up and banged up where it had to have the lower unit pried off of the engine, which would show, you know, a lack of maintenance? Same thing for the cowling. When you go to take the cowling off, all those latches stuck, are they hard? 
is it hard to steer looking at those grease fittings where you put the grease in does it look like they've been greased in the past 10 years um and then once you get the cowling off you're going to be visually looking at all the stuff on the engine is there a ton of salt on the engine is there a lot of rusty components does it look like the thing has been serviced regularly um hopefully there's some dates on like the water separators or the oil filters does that date say you know 10 years ago, we got an oil filter, stuff like that. The visual inspection of an outboard is probably going to be your number one thing to look at when you are inspecting an outboard to buy it. And then also I would talk about the model and the year, the brand, that kind of stuff. Is it a brand or a model year that has known issues with it? You're also going to want to look at the records, service records. You know, when was it last maintenance done? the oil changes, the gear lubes, um, spark plugs, anodes, stuff like that. Look visually looking at those anodes too. Does it look like they've ever been changed? Are they original? Are they, you know, 50% gone? You're going to want to run a compression test. That kind of gives you the internal health of the mechanical aspects of that engine. You just basically want your numbers to be all within a line, no more than like 10% difference. So if you got 195 PSI on one cylinder, you don't want to have 150 on another cylinder. You want them to all be within 10% or so. So 195 to 185 across the board, that's going to be what you want to see. You all, you know, if they're all 180, 185, 179, something like that, those are the compression test numbers that you're going to want to see, which is something else that you want to look at when you're buying an outboard. Also looking at your prop, making sure that it's not, you know, all dinged up on the leading edge. One of the ears isn't folded over, which would indicate that they hit ground at some point in time. So doing the visual inspection of the outboard before you buy it is probably your number one way of avoiding an issue. And that's above and beyond the age and the hours of the engine. If you're buying an engine that's 20 years old with 6,000 hours, you're you should already know what you're getting yourself into and be very leery of buying something that is that used because this gets into talking about what makes an outboard unreliable and all of these things that we just talked about are what makes it unreliable the lack of maintenance the old rusty components the lack of grease and oil on things the salt buildup on the starter on the alternator um, corroded connections, old battery cables that have been, you know, had really tight bins in them. Things like that are what's going to cause you a problem and make it unreliable. So like take the battery cables, for instance, or your main harness that's feeding the engine. You want those harnesses because it is a wire and it's stranded. You don't want to have sharp bins in it. It's not like a solid copper wire where you can make a 90 degree bin and not have a problem. If you take a, a wire like that on a boat and you you know, kink it. So let's say you've got an extra five feet of wire. Most people want to just leave that wire. You need to loop it up in a circle. So that way it has a nice bend to it. And it's not, you know, creating a restriction point for the electrical current to run through that wire. But if you've got a wire and it's bent like this and then zip tied like that, and then it's just got this straight sharp bend in it. Well, over time that stranded wire, which is what's used on the wires on a boat is going to fail one strain at a time and over 10, 15 years of running and bouncing around and taking the beating of being in the water, that is a failure point on that wire. And eventually it's going to cause you problems and it's going to fail. So looking for those kinds of things is going to help you to alleviate something that's going to be unreliable. And in order to make the engine more reliable, you just have to service all those items, you know, servicing regularly at the proper intervals, doing your oil changes, gear loop changes, fuel filters regularly, check in your, you know, connection points at the batteries, at your power posts in the back. If you've got junction transfer lugs in the back, also looking at things like, you know, oiling these things, putting CRC on the engine, corrosion protection, changing the anodes, greasing, oiling all those components, like the shift shaft that goes down to the lower unit. A lot of them has a, has a grease fitting, or if it doesn't have a grease fitting, can you get in there and spray some WD-40 or some other kind of oil that will help keep that lubed up? Some kind of a penetrating oil or a corrosive you know, protection oil to help keep that component from drying out and rusting up and then you know building up salt on it. One of the biggest problems that you're going to have with an outboard is when you let it sit. 
if it doesn't get used for six years, I mean, that that's potentially a problem. It's also an opportunity for a deal. If you can find one that was flushed, fogged, put away and properly oiled and lubed up, and then it got put away. Well, that engine sitting with all that oil and everything on it, it's going to be, you know, you get it out, put oil in into the cylinders before you try and crank it, try and lube up everything, empty out the fuel system and get new fuel, good fuel to the engine. Then, you know, that's probably a really good engine to get, even though it's been sitting, as long as you do those prep things before you just go and try use it. And then everything's oiled up and now you start using it. You might be able to find yourself a deal that way. But if that engine has been sitting for six, seven years and nothing's been moving, that's what makes it unreliable. So if you've got an outboard and you know you put it away for season, say you're up north and you winterize your engine and then put it away, as long as everything's lubed up, whenever you get it out, you're going to be fine. But if you don't and you just let it sit there, it could be a problem. Or if you're in a climate where, you know, your boating season is seven, eight months long, what you can do is if you don't get to run your boat regularly, at least try and start the engine and run it every couple of weeks. Let water flow through it. Let it heat up. Check the oils. Um, move the throttle. Shift it. Steer it back and forth. So that way, all those components, as long as you're moving them and they stay lubed, greased, and oiled, it's going to work that grease, it's going to work that oil into those pivot points and those um, places where it, it has movement. That's going to keep them from freezing up, drying up, and causing you some unreliability problems later on. 